All right, so today uh, <clears throat> we're going to start uh, the last section of the class, um, which is transverse loads. So we looked at loads, uh, axial loads, last uh, the last couple of uh, weeks, either compressive or torsional. Uh, and here we're going to look at what happened when you have a load that, come, that goes across a member. Uh, and so the first one is going to be bending stress, right? So this is going to be a stress uh, that tries to bend a long member like that. Uh, and so we, uh, that's categorized as one of our transverse loads. All right, so we've looked at loads along the axis of a beam. Now we look at forces and moments along the transverse axis. Uh, the bending deformation is a moment along the transverse axis, right? So if I have my axis across this pen here, I'm going to add a bending moment to it here which is a bend. How about that? Huh? All right. It acts around the transverse axis, and we can see that um, with this here, right? This is our z-axis across our member here, uh, and we're going to bend that around that transverse axis. This creates both compressive and tensile stresses, uh, which makes it a little more complicated uh, than some of the stuff we've dealt with before. So up here, you can imagine uh, those little cuboids there, those differential cuboids are getting compressed. The ones down on the bottom here are being extended. And so we have different kinds of stresses uh, within a bending object. There's one point in the middle, right, where it's can, it can't be, it has to be neither uh, compressive or uh, extensive, extending, uh, and that's going to happen right at our neutral surface, which is at um, our centroid of this area. So we have a centroidal axis here um, at which my bending stress is zero, and that axis extends all the way through the member, and so sometimes we'll call that the neutral surface or a neutral plane. So that's the basics of bending here. And here we see another image of um, compression here, extension here, and then this line here stays the same length between there and there, uh, and that's our neutral surface. So what do we do next? We do a differential analysis, right? <laughs> Woo -hoo! Time to... Uh, bring out our, uh, our little magnifying glasses. So our little guy brings out his magnifying glass over here. Uh, but I'm actually not going to go through the details of this differential analysis. Uh, you can check that out in the textbook. Uh, but what we find is that the local strain um, varies according to its position along y. Right. So if our y-axis goes from top to bottom of our member. Uh, rho here is um, the radius of curvature. So we kind of have to look at this figure here. And so you can see the smaller rho is, the more this is going to bend. If you have a small radius of curvature, your curve gets tighter and tighter and tighter. So a small rho on the, in the denominator here is going to create a large strain. And that makes sense to us, right? The more we bend this object, the higher our strain values are going to be. Y is our distance from that neutral surface, okay? And so this negative here, we can, we can figure it out mathematically, but really all it's saying is, okay, if I go a Y distance in this direction, I'm going to get a compressive strain of this side. If I go y in the other direction, I'm going to get an extensive or a tensile strain uh, in those uh, parts of the member. So if c is the maximum distance between our neutral axis uh, and the outermost fiber, which in this case would be up here, uh, then we can write this down here, where this is the maximum strain. This tells us this, the local strain at a given value of y. Okay. The advantage of this guy over this one is that we don't need to know the radius of curvature, right? Which is something we often don't know. These 
uh, in, say, a steel member, that radius of curvature is going to be quite large and very hard to uh, and very hard to measure. All right. So all strain in this uh, simplified bending, what I mean by that is like in a very simple case, is normal strain. Okay, and again, you can imagine in a real case that might be true, there might, or might not be true. There might be a small twist in this, um, in the member um, that causes some shear strains and so forth. But when we simplify it mathematically, we get all normal stresses, and they vary linearly uh, in a linear elastic material with the distance from the neutral surface. So if I plot those stresses out, um, I could say uh, it's going to be this value y times some coefficient is going to give me my stress. And so uh, we say that it varies linearly. This I noted before that that sign tells us something that we're going to have on one direction y, we're going to have a, a compressive strain and stress, and the other direction we're going to have a tensile strain. And then the next step is to connect stress to the internal moment, right? Which is something that we're oftentimes uh, might know. We'll be able to calculate a force and calculate a moment. Um, in that sense, we can take, um, think about our torque here around the neutral axis. That's going to be these stresses, right? If I wanted to calculate the torque around here, I'd find the size of this area times y, right? I'd find the size of this area times y. That's what this is telling us, right? Sigma here is the length of that area of that arrow times y times dA. That is the size of that differential um, segment uh, that's at a given spot. And so we integrate that torque that's created by all of these different forces over the entire surface of the member. Uh, and if we do a little um, math magic here and take this value uh, and put it in here, we come up with this equation. Our moment is going to be um, uh, a function of our maximum stress. And this guy, what's that? That's our second moment of area, right? Or what we've been calling the moment of inertia. Okay. So here's our relationship between the moment, the resultant moment within that uh, member, and the stresses uh, within that member. And so if we know the moment, we can calculate this guy, um, we can find that one, and then we can know what our maximum stress is. So this is a really useful uh, starting point for us uh, as we do problems. So that, if we rearrange those things, we've got this right here. Um, our maximum stress here, which is useful for us in a design problem, uh, and our local stress here. And this is called the flexure formula. Uh, and the I in here, as we noted on the last slide, is the second moment of area there. Uh, that's our moment of inertia, which we know how to calculate already. All right, so that's a bending moment. Uh, uh, or rather bending um, formula and the flexure formula. Uh, and in the next little lecture, we'll do a problem.